have made it to day 19 of the vid 21 conference my name is julia Steele, the creator and host and wherever you are joining from in the world welcome to the last day of vid for 2021 uh, we are in for an absolute treat this morning but before i get into who our speaker is just want to take you right back to where we started this session um, and this journey for vid 21 this year and that was about shaping your future and throughout vid we've talked and heard from many, many speakers around leadership, strategy, change, projects, um, how you might want to shape your life, your business. We've been incredibly inspired. But here's the thing. When we leave this session today, when we close VID for the year, you're all going to go back to your jobs, to your lives, hopefully with something to say. You're going to need to give a talk to someone, whether it's your boss, your husband, your business party, partner, your client, you're gonna have something to say to them. And so this last speaker today, Eric Edmonds joins us live from the Caribbean, and he's gonna to talk to us about one talk and how we are all one talk away from changing our lives, from shaping the future that we want. And I just want you to embrace everything that you've learned, hear what he's got to say, so that we've got, that we can leave vid 21 and, and go out into the world and shape the future. Eric is the founder of Speaker Nation. He's a compelling speaker and prolific entrepreneur, having owned companies in four countries, including those in mobile computing, military research and development, 3D camera engineering, and Hollywood special effects, where he worked on James Cameron, smash hits, Avatar, and movies in the Transformers, Iron Man, and Pirates of the Caribbean franchises. Today, Eric is regarded as one of the most entertaining and transformational speakers in the world. His programs are some of the highest rated in the industry and his flagship health, and coach, health coaching program, WildFit, has been the highest rated program on the Mind Valley platform for two years in a row. Eric's family immigrated to Canada from South Africa when he was a child. At 15, he was homeless and on the streets, but he turned his life around and has enjoyed significant personal and business success ever since. Today, Eric is an internationally recognized business speaker and has spoken in over 25 countries and has shared the stage with Tony Robbins, President Bill Clinton, Sir Richard Branson, and Jack Canfield. In 2018, Eric was awarded a medal by the Canadian Senate for his efforts in helping people improve the quality of his lives. And he now lives in the Caribbean and enjoys kiteboarding and spending time with his family. And I, I can't think of a better place in the world, Eric, to maybe have spent the last 12 months than in the Caribbean. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's so great to have you here. Hey, Julia, thanks so much. Really, really glad to be here. And um, I'm, I'm glad to be bringing everything that's been discussed over the last 19 days together into one of what I believe to be the most important topics in the world, and that is communication. The quality of your business life, your profession, your family, your parenting, your friendships, everything has a lot to do with how effective you are and how confident you are with communicating. And so I'm really glad to share a concept with you and some strategies that you can employ immediately to become more comfortable and confident about communicating your messages out to the world. So maybe I should give a little bit of background. Um, I know many of you are from uh, parts of the world that I, I, I haven't spent so much time in of late. And so I want to give you um, I want to give you a little bit of background so that you kind of get uh, where I'm coming from in this. My, uh, I, I was born in South Africa and raised in Canada as an immigrant child and went through the whole, you know, pretty normal, uh, you know, upbringing of divorce and breakup and, you know, the tumultuous stuff of childhood. And uh, one day, uh, leaving school, I decided to go into business. I decided to go and get a sales job in a business. And that was kind of my initial career choice. And one thing it's really important to know is throughout that time, throughout high school and that initial decision, I was absolutely terrified of public speaking. I'm talking about a, a level of fear that um, I, I, I don't know how to describe it for you. Like if you asked me to do a talk, you called me on Monday and said, could you come do a talk at my organization on Friday? I would say no, and, and no, there would be no other answer. But then I would be unable to eat food for the rest of the week up until your conference was over. 
And I'd said, no, imagine how I might've felt if I said yes, right? And, and the reason I mention this to you is that my life took a decided turn when I overcame my fears and I learned some key things about how to get out into the world and how to, how to feel comfortable about getting my word out and how to be effective at it. And, and ultimately I have a theory for you. And the theory I have for you is that you, yes, you, you that I'm talking to right now, Sharon, Nosh, Mel, Sue, like the, you, the people that I'm looking at right now that are, that are with us, um, I want you to know that you are one talk away from something big. You are one talk away from a phenomenal breakthrough. You are one talk away from a book deal. You're one talk away from funding your company. You're one talk away from recruiting that person that you really need on your side right now. You're one talk away from a ton of the resources that you're looking for. At any point in time, you are one well-constructed, one well-delivered talk away from the next big breakthrough of your life. And I wanna talk about why that is. You see, for the vast majority of human history, we only had two models of learning. One was to do things, and the other one was to listen to stories about things being done. Uh, take hunting, for example. The old hunter-gatherer history of humans is a bit like this, that if you're six years old, you can't go hunting. <laughs> it's not safe. You're not big enough, fast enough, strong enough. About the only purpose you might serve to go hunting is bait. So you're not going to be helpful on the trip. But at the same time, there's going to come a point in time when you're 11 or 12 years old where it will be appropriate for you to start accompanying uh, the hunters on some of the trips. And at that stage, you'd better know a thing or two, right? You'd better know something about hunting. But fortunately for you, you will have been sitting around a fire and you will have been listening to stories about hunting for all of your life so far. And so as a consequence of that, you will have some general understanding, some strategic understandings and some organizing principles about the way hunting works that will mean when you go out on your first hunting trip, you will actually be relatively effective. And, and, and that's been going on. I mean, humans have arguably had fire for about 2 million years. And I would suggest that the primary method of, primary method of pre-learning has been pre-learning around the fire through not lectures, but through stories. We're not very good at receiving lectures. <laughs> it's, it's not, we're not very good at that. Like, I don't know if any of you found that when you went to school, if you think back now, I'll bet you, you have a whole bunch of teachers that were completely forgettable and a bunch of information they gave you that was completely forgettable. But there were one or two teachers that, that sunk in that you might even remember some of the specific lessons they taught or stories they told. And you remember their name and you, re and you remember them with some fondness. And you know why? It's because they didn't spend the whole time lecturing they shared stories and that that was a much more effective way of, of communicating and so i believe i really believe that our brains evolved to become very good at absorbing information that comes in story delivery not nearly as good at information coming in the form of a list here are eight things you have to remember no no let me tell you a story about how i learned these eight things so that you can embody the story into yourself so I believe that the reason talks are so powerful is that there's an evolutionary underpinning behind this. Our brains evolved to be good at soaking up stories. And, 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 and if we think about this, there is something called the stage effect. And the stage effect is the bizarre attraction that somebody takes when they, that, they, that, they, that they get when they go on stage. So they go on stage, they could be a musician, they could be a speaker, they could be a comedian, but there's some attraction that gets created when they stand up on stage, they put themselves at risk and they deliver value to the audience, they, they give energy to the audience and then that creates this, this, this sense of attraction. And, and one way to think about it is, is that if you have two business consultants and they both go to the same networking event and the one is a very good networker and he's, he or she is walking around with business cards connecting and trying to remember everybody and be remembered by everybody. And then the other one says, you know what? I, I just can't be bothered with all that. I'm gonna contact the organizers. I'm gonna book myself a keynote presentation, I'm going to spend 45 minutes on the stage and I'm going to deliver so much value in that 45 minutes that the audience cannot help but remember me. Well, you know what? That person is far more likely to be remembered by a much higher number of people, but that's not where the magic stops. The other thing is, is that, well, having a big audience listen to your presentation, either because you're at a live event or because you've got people watching you live or because it's views that you're recording in video programs or videos that you've uploaded to YouTube or Vimeo or something, that large audience or those large numbers of views are kind of like the lineup outside the restaurant or lights out the nightclub. You know, you drive by and you're like, you know, why didn't they have that lineup? Like I was in Amsterdam about two years ago and I'm not really one to eat French fries, right? It's not really my thing, but I'm walking along and there's all these like French fries places in Amsterdam, 
but one of them says world's best French fries, world's best frites, right? So you, oh, that's interesting. What a claim to make on their sign. But that sign by itself wouldn't do it. What really did it was there were like 60 people lined up to get in there. And there was another frites place just across the street with no lineup. I'm like, I don't even eat French fries and I wanna line up at that place. Like there's something about it. When there's a bunch of attention on something, it boosts its attractiveness. So a bunch of people in the lineup is a bunch of attention. And then that people in the lineup attention gets communicated to your subconscious like, well, if they all wanna be there, I wanna be there. And that's exactly what happens when you invoke the stage effect, when you stand on stage or stand in front of a camera and you give and you give from your heart and you have an impact on people, the more people you have an impact on, the greater attraction you create, which attracts more people. And it's an incredible compounding circle. And, and, and there are some examples I wanna offer you because you see, when, when people think about, when I talk about being one talk away, they, what does that exactly does that mean one talk away? Well, I, I'll give you an example out of my own life in a moment, but let's just start with Simon Sinek. My guess is that you are probably familiar with Simon Sinek, maybe. If you're not familiar with Simon, um, well, it probably means you don't spend a lot of time on TED Talks or YouTube or what have you. But what I can tell you is that back in 2009, Simon Sinek was Simon Sinek. He was just a guy and, and, and he, he was just a guy doing his thing and he went and got invited to do a TED Talk. And so he did this one TED Talk and it was uh, a talk about, you know, uh, um, it, it basically, it was a talk about leadership and, and that sort of stuff. It was a high, like how, to get, how great leaders can inspire action in people. And he did this at TED Talk, at a TEDx conference in Puget Sound. So not the main TED stage, you understand, just, just one of these, you know, the small licensed TEDx conferences by comparison. And he did this talk in September. And that video now has over 40 million views. He has multiple New York Times bestseller uh, books and his speaking fees, incidentally, have changed because back in 2009, here he is speaking at a TED Talk, which you typically do for free. Two years later, his booking fee as, uh, was $25,000 for a single talk. I want you to think about that. <laughs> it's like, I want you to think about that. Now, many of you have no desire to become a keynote speaker, and I, I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about the comparative value here. How many of you would like to be in a situation where somebody would be willing to pay you $25,000 for an hour? I hope a lot of you, <laughs> it's a kind of exciting idea. Incidentally, by April, 2019, his speaking fee had gone up to $100,000 for a keynote. And I imagine it's significantly higher than that today. And, and, and then I think some of you are gonna go, yeah, well, it, you know, the speaking industry is like dominated by men. Okay, there's some truth to that. And I will address that in a minute, but it's not a problem, by the way, it's a phenomenal opportunity. And I'll discuss why that is. But let's talk a little bit about Brené Brown. And by the way, while I say this to you, um, I want you guys to be with me. And what I mean by that is, this is not Netflix. This is not a documentary. This is not a, a TV show. You and I are in a conference call right now. We're having a conversation. And I, I do notice that most of you are cameras off and you know, maybe you're a little shy. Maybe you didn't get your makeup on yet this morning. Uh, you know, I, I totally get that that might be the case. And you don't need to go cameras on, but if you want to, I'd love that. I'd love to be more connected with you, but also use the chat. If you've got a question or you've got a comment or you wanna throw something in there, Use the chat and engage with me because I want to give you everything that you need to get from this talk. So I hope so. Uh, <laughs> Mel, I totally get it. I totally get it. And you could let go of that and just be here with us anyway, but I totally get it. Now, let's talk about Brené Brown. Brené Brown, she did her one talk on vulnerability and she did that at TEDx Houston in June of 2010. Now, here's something interesting about Mel. Mel is a scientist. She's been doing research on vulnerability for a very long time and she'd done many, many talks before but none of them took off like this talk. And the difference was that she did something that we're gonna talk a little bit about in a, in, a, in a moment here. She did something phenomenal and that was that she spoke with vulnerability. You see, before she spoke about vulnerability, do you understand the difference? One is lecturing, the other one is telling stories about your personal life. And she really connected with the audience and, and, and by the way, she was not happy about this initially. <laughs> if you watch her documentary, which by the way, she has that documentary because of that TED talk. But if you watch the documentary, you will see her talk about finding out that her video had been uploaded online. And she's like, what the hell? I thought it was just that audience. Now it's online. Now 60 people have watched it. Now 600 people have watched it. Now, now 6,000 people have watched it. And she apparently tried to have them take it down. She tried to have it taken down. She take it down. I don't want and of course, no, they didn't take it down. And now it has close to 40 million views. She has five New York Times bestsellers under her belt. And, you know, and she's, you know, she's been on Oprah. She's completely transformed her existence. One talk, 
one talk. And by the way, it, it's not just in this like, you know, author or, or, or key person of influence type space. It's also in politics. Um, Barack Obama uh, in, in Michelle's book, Michelle talks about what life was like for them before the whole presidential thing and so on. And apparently she, he, Barack gave this one talk. And it was a 20 minute talk or so. And he gave this one talk and something about that talk just caught everybody on fire. And suddenly the questions that reporters were asking him were no longer about local Chicago or local Illinois state, Illinois state affairs. They started asking him questions about the national stage. They started asking him questions of national importance. And the press asking him those questions allowed him to start commenting on things at a national significance level. And that laid the foundation for him to launch a presidential run. And they say, like Michelle talks about it in the book that she, they, they often used to think back, it might've been that one talk. It might've just been that one talk that set the whole thing off. And I don't know, tell me in the chat, you guys, who's had this experience? You're, you're a kid and then you grow up and then at some point you rent a car for the first time or you stay in a hotel for the first time or you fly, maybe even in business class for the first time. And as you're in the hotel room or in the car, you're kind of like, I hope they don't catch me. Like you feel a bit like a fraud, right? Like, well, should I even be in this hotel room? You feel a little, well, I want you to imagine what it must've been like for Barack and Michelle Obama to be sitting in the White House. Just, just think of the significance of that. They're sitting in the White House and they're having dinner and they're suddenly thinking, it's down to that one talk. It's down to that one talk. One talk can change everything for you. And, and by the way, here's a question I have for you. You can participate if you want, or you could just think about it in your head, but here's my question for you. If you could deliver one talk that changed everything for you, for your social cause, for your business, for your employment, for whatever it is that you're interested in having an impact in, what could one talk do for you? I'm curious, like what could it do? What could one well-constructed, one well-delivered talk do for you? Think about that. Think about it. And, I, and I'm going to give you some examples from my own life. Um, I was standing on stage in London, England some years ago. And uh, at that time, I was beginning to contemplate writing some books. And I, you know, I have a lot of content that I want to write about, a lot of different life experiences and so forth. And I, you know, I hadn't really had time to go shopping for an agent, but I thought, you know what? I don't have time for shopping an agent. My, my speak your schedule is crazy. So I'm just going to start like mentioning that I'm writing a book. And so I did this talk one day and I mentioned in there that I'm working on this particular book and, um, and that, you know, I haven't even shopped for an agent yet, blah, blah, blah. And immediately, immediately after the talk, there's a lineup of people, right? A lineup of people looking for things for selfies, autographs, just having a chat. And this one woman walks up to me, she goes, I'm an agent, I would love to represent you. And she represents one of the biggest publishing uh, companies there. It was really fascinating. And uh, one talk, one talk made that connection and that hookup. Uh, another example, which basically has changed my entire life was that I was speaking at a private mastermind in, uh, um, in North America. I was speaking at this private mastermind and I knew that the founder of Mind Valley, and if you guys aren't familiar with Mind Valley, Mind Valley might be the largest sort of personal development education company on earth. And, and, and I, I knew the founder was there and, and I had this idea that I would love to get one of my programs published on their platform. So I was, I was preparing to do my talk and I want you to think about this now. I know the founder, his name is Vishen. I know him very well and I know, and even then I knew about him very well. And one of the things I knew is he's very busy. And so he's not gonna show up for any of the talks that are being delivered by somebody that he hasn't heard of before. And he certainly hadn't heard of me. And so how was I gonna get him to be there? Well, we ended up having a very casual chat on one of the bus rides for this private mastermind. And he, go, and he goes, oh, uh, I, I said to him, what are you interested in these days? And he says, well, I'm interested in biohacking. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. That's what my talk is about tomorrow. And he goes, it is. And I'm thinking it is now. Now, here's the truth is my talk was actually about evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology and something that I call the evolution gap, which is this gap between the pace of change in our society, in our civilization, in our technology, and our genes struggling to catch up with that. So this is why we have cravings for sweet things because our ancestors needed sweet things only now we don't need that craving anymore. And so that was what my talk was about, which is the fundamental foundation of any biohacking. So he showed up for the talk. And here's, here are some of the things that happened as a result of him showing up for the talk. He showed up for the talk and immediately asked me to speak at a conference on biohacking in Mykonos, Greece a couple of months later. I show up in Mykonos, Greece and I give my talk. I give one talk. He then comes up to me and he goes, you know, um, we got a little bit of a complaint from the audience. And I'm like, holy crap, what? And he goes, no, 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 not about you. The complaint was we didn't give you enough time on stage. Could you do another one? And so I ended up doing a second talk. And then he called me some weeks later and said, your two talks were the highest rated talks of the conference. 
and I want to talk about publishing your program. Then he ended up publishing my program on his platform, on the Mind Valley platform, and, and he published it on the program. And we went from having maybe 150 to 200 clients a year through my company, WildFit, because it was a hobby. It was a hobby, guys. It was a hobby. It was a company I started out of passion with no interest in it being about money. It was a hobby. And then I started that hobby and 150 clients a year were going through this program. And all of a sudden, after that one talk and then getting published on Mind Valley, we went immediately to 5,000 people that next year. And now we've had over 50,000 people do that program in 130 countries around the world. There's not a single day that doesn't go by, that goes by that I don't get a letter from somebody about how they've lost 30, 40 pounds, how they've reversed their type 2 diabetes, how they've got off their prescription medication for hypertension, how their inflammation is gone, how their sex drive has come back, how their fertility is there. Like, not a day goes by that I don't get a message like that. I got one just about a week ago. This woman wrote to me and she goes, in January of last year, I was hypertensive on medication for it. I was type two diabetic on medication for it. I was depressed and I was obese. And she goes, and then I ended up doing your wild fit program. And I did all that. And I lost half of my weight, half of the weight she wanted to lose in three months. So she still has a little bit more to go. She says, but I'm off, off all medication. I'm no longer type two diabetic and I'm no longer hypertensive. She goes, that would be a good enough story already. But she says, I also just got COVID-19. And she said, it was devastating. It was, a, it was the worst illness I've ever had. But I can tell you something right now. If I was still carrying that extra 40 pounds, that extra 20 kilos, if I was still on all those medications, COVID would have killed me. And by the way, statistically, she's right. The most dangerous way in the world to get COVID is to be obese, hypertensive, and diabetic. I mean, that's not, it, you know, and, and, and you know what's really interesting? That happened because of one talk. By the way, here's what else happened. In the meantime, all these people from around the world have done this program. Now we have 400 some odd coaches around the world. And then I get a call from the Canadian government. The Canadian government wants me to come to the Senate. And they want me to come to the Senate because they want to give me a medal on the Senate floor with the Speaker of the House, like a whole ceremony. It was incredible. Hello. Did you have fun? Hello, everybody. All right. I will be done and I'll come out and play. You want to go swimming? You want to swim? Okay. Yeah, go get your swimsuit on. We'll, we'll take care of it. I'm swimming with my clothes on. You're going to swim with your clothes on. Zoe, get your swimsuit on. She has this thing about swimming with her clothes on. It's like a, it's like a, you know, a little uh, uh, a rebellion of some kind. Uh, so anyway, uh, you guys got to meet Zoe. That, that happened. Um, I, one, one of my policies is I, no matter what, that door's open to her all the time. So forgive me for the pause. Now, I think, I, I think at this point, I've made the point that one talk can change everything for you. I hope that I've made that point. It certainly has changed my life. And, and by changing my life, I, I have had an impact on hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people around the world, as I now have videos with millions of views and hundreds of thousands of views and all this kind of stuff. And so I want to share with you how you can do this. I want to share with you some core principles about how to design a really great talk. And I want you to design it in a way where you never, ever need to use notes ever again. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about how to deliver it. And I'm going to go through it quite quickly. And I'm going to go through it quite quickly because I'd love to talk with you a bit about it. I'd love to answer any questions you guys have toward the end. So I'm going to try and save a little bit of time at the end for questions. For those of you who are live, uh, anybody who's watching on recording, I'll make you a deal. I'll make you a deal. I manage my own Instagram. And over the course of the next, like, say, up until the end of the weekend, if you write to me and ask me any questions, I'll do what I can to answer them as best I can. After the weekend, I can't promise anymore. I can't keep up with all that. But that's my undertaking in case you're watching this on the recording. Now, one talk can change everything. I, I, I'm hoping I've made that case. I'm hoping you're with me on that. It can change everything. So the issue is, though, it better be a good talk, right? Like, one bad talk could also change everything, but maybe in the wrong direction. So what we want to do is maybe focus on how we can deliver one talk that will change everything in the best possible way. And by the way, those of you who have upgraded the cameras on, it's really nice to see you. I really like that. It makes it more fun. Incidentally, guys, when you guys are doing video conferences and video presentations and that kind of stuff, I really implore you to create a culture with your clients and your fans and that kind of stuff to go cameras on for meetings whenever possible. Of course, it's not always appropriate, but wherever possible, because it, it allows you to feel their energy better. And we're going to talk why, about why that's important in a minute. And it also creates a sense of accountability in them. Uh, suddenly they feel like they can be seen as well. So they're a little less likely to zoom off to Facebook and do all that kind of stuff. That said, there are better ways to stop them from going to Facebook and that's called engagement. Now, first of all, I wanna suggest that 
here are some rules. Never, ever, ever again, write out one of the talks you're delivering. Just don't do that anymore. Like if you're, if you're the type of person who normally has a talk you're going to do and you write it out and you write it all out and you write it out and you've got this whole script and you write it out, I want you to know that if I'm in the audience, I'm going to know you've written it out. I'm going to know you've written it out because of a few reasons. One is nobody talks like that. <laughs> like nobody, nobody talks in well-written sentences. I mean, not the president, not the past president of the United States. Nobody, nobody talks in, you know, it's funny, a lot of people criticize Donald Trump for the way he talks, but honestly, if you listen to yourself talk and transcribe it, it's not really that different. We break our sentences, we got, you might lie a little less, but you know, generally speaking, generally speaking, we, we don't speak in, uh, in complete sentences, we break things up and so on. So if you write in complete sentences, you're immediately gonna sound artificial. Plus, you're, another problem is that you will, you will speak like you're reading because you're in a sense reading the script from your mind. So it'll be like, Hello, everybody. I'm very excited today to talk to you about the fact that one talk can change everything. I have written this out in perfect grammatical order so that each sentence has perfect pronunciation and I even have paragraph stops. <gasps> I mean, no, 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 no. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. If you're going to do talks like that, you need to offer this disclaimer at the front end. Please don't listen to this talk while operating heavy machinery. <laughs> like that's like, you know, don't do it. Don't do it. So that's another reason. And here's another reason why. Because you have a couple of different ways of remembering things. And one of them is called um, chained memory. In other words, you remember A, and you remember that B comes after A, and then C. But if anybody asks you, what's the 23rd letter of the alphabet? <laughs> Amy, <laughs> like you, we, we've memorized them in, 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 in a chain. So you need to say them in a chain to get to the next one. So if you write your scripts out, then you're going to have to say one sentence to remember the next sentence. God forbid you forget one of your sentences. You're screwed in the middle of nowhere. And now you're gonna have to have notes or you're gonna have to use slides or something to keep you on script. I hope I've made the argument in a compelling way that one does not write out their speeches. What I do believe is that it's a great idea to have your speeches uh, in bullet point form in bullet point form. So you kind of know what you're covering, but not necessarily the specific words you're going to be using, because what you really want to do is ad lib your topic so that it comes from your heart. And if it comes from your heart, it will go to their heart. And then they will feel a sense of emotional connection with you. Are you guys all with me on this? Does this make sense? All right, cool. So that's the first thing. So then the second thing is, and I want to breeze over this. It's more complicated. You can definitely find me talking about this on YouTube. In fact, there's one video on YouTube that you, if, if my talk here is really fun for you, then there's a video on YouTube called something like how to become a master public speaker or something like that. And I, I need to say some things about that talk before you go watch it. I didn't know they were recording it. I didn't know it was going to go on YouTube. I didn't know it was going to get 1.4 million views. And by the way, 1.4 million views, it's not so many views really these days. I mean, videos get 100 million. Hang on. It's an hour and a half. So you have to understand 1.4 million views of an hour and a half video, YouTube loves that. That's why they keep sharing it with people. But I mentioned to you that I didn't know it was being recorded, that I didn't know it was gonna end up online because I'm dressed horribly. I was casual. It was like, I'm wearing a, sh a crappy shirt, my hair slicked back. I had no idea. So I'm horribly embarrassed that it's online. But that said, if you watch it, just close your eyes and listen. And there's some good content there for you, I hope. And it will go deeper into this concept that I'm going to share with you now called the speech map. Now, a speech map, you know, spontaneously. Look at that. We're going to have a spontaneous flip chart here. Um, spontaneously, the way a speech map works is we take a look and go, I want to talk about a topic. And we put the topic in the middle. And many of you will be familiar with mind mapping, right? You've done some kind of mind mapping work or what have you. So I, I put the topic in the middle, and then what I want to do is I want to launch my talk with something we call an F-15. I'm going to come to that in a minute. Then I am going to construct my talk. And I'm going to describe this construction in a minute. All right. So there's my talk. And what it basically means is, first of all, the F-15 is how you start. It, it, the metaphor here is like a, uh, um, it, the metaphor here is a bit like, say, a fighter plane, an F-15 fighter plane. Why is that on a funny angle? I don't like that at all. 
It's it, it, my OCD inside is just aching at that funny angle. All right, hang on. Here, let's see if I can fix it a little. Okay, marginally better. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and live with it. Now, oh, by the way, one tip. Never tell the audience when something is wrong like that, like I just did for you. Don't do that. Don't tell them. Just, just go on with it. Just go with the flow. I'm showing you what not to do so you learn in a practical way. An F-15, a fighter plane will use half of its jet fuel just to take off on a short sortie. And you, as a speaker, doing a presentation. Remember, this is not about a keynote. You could be a professional speaker. You could be an entrepreneur trying to raise money. You could be a politician trying to launch your campaign. You could be working for a social project or an environmental project or something. The, the rules are the same. I'm speaking to anybody who wants to become an effective communicator. This works whether you're talking in front of an audience. This works whether you're talking in front of a camera. So it's, it's cross-purpose in every way. And the F-15 is your launch. And if you put a huge amount of effort into really knowing your launch, then you will be able to glide through the balance of your presentation and it's super effective. So what are some of the things that, what are some of the things that should belong in your F-15? Well, an introduction. One key about the introduction though, is that you should provide a script to whoever's producing your event and they should follow that script, even if they know you quite well. Because I'll tell you right now, the number of times I've gone to an event, I went to this event in Thailand last year to speak for a major organization, and I was doing a very important presentation, and the guy walks up to me 60 seconds before I'm on stage and goes, hey, what should I say about you? We sent you a script, dude. Like, there's a script. Oh, he goes, I never got it. Oh, well, I'll just make it up. Guy doesn't know me, doesn't know anything. He goes, our next speaker is named, what's your name again? Eric. Honestly, that was the introduction. So... You want to get them a script. You want to make sure the script is solid and, 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 and well-constructed. And, and by the way, if you are comfortable with the script, it's probably wrong. Because the script should probably make you a little uncomfortable. The script should make you sound more amazing than you're willing to accept you are. When Julia went through that script, I'm like, every single thing that she did in that script, she actually asked me before the break. She goes, Eric, are, are you happy with the script that we were sent? I'm like, I don't know. I trust my people. I didn't send it. They sent it. I said, I trust my people. She goes, well, that's good. And then she's reading it. And, and what happens inside me? Oh, Eric did this. And then he worked on all these movies, Avatar, Pirates of the Caribbean. And then he got a medal from the, and I'm like, oh God, the, the, the Australians are going to love this. They're going to get, they're going to go, oh, we're going to have to cut him down to size. Yeah. He said, that introduction is just too big. And I'm like, you know, hang on a minute. If your introduction is, remember, nobody needs to be cut down to size. If it's somebody else bigging them up. Isn't it true? If you stand on stage and go, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that, then somebody's thinking, we got to cut him down to size. But if it's somebody else doing it, they don't think that. So you have the introduction written by somebody, written by you, but read by the, by the, by the, by the organizer or the MC. Then you should have some kind of icebreaker, some kind of icebreaker just to get, just to get going, a funny joke or you know, something silly. Like here's one that I often use. So I got invited to do this talk and um, it was a talk for Tony Robbins. So I was doing a business talk at one of his workshops and he didn't know me and I didn't really know him. And, 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 and the only reason I was there is because they couldn't find anybody else, frankly. And so they just, they, that's how it was. And so Tony was not going to introduce me. No way was he going to introduce me because what if I bomb? He doesn't even want to, he doesn't even want to be near me on the stage in case I bomb because he doesn't know me. And I'm not a speaker. I wasn't even a speaker back then. So then he and I meet in the hallway there. Like, it kind of goes like this. They're like, uh, it's, it kind of goes like this. It's like, um, I, Eric, uh, Tony wants to meet you out in the hallway. I'm like, okay. So I go out in the hallway, I walk out and I go, hi, uh, hi, Tony. Like, no kidding, like, no kidding. He's like, how are you feeling about your presentation? Uh, you know, you guys gave me 11 days notice. You want me to use somebody else's slides. It's, it's not my content, you know, I, it could be better. Well, you could be a lot more confident. No kidding. That's what he said with that tone of voice. And I, and I was like, okay, I learned something from Tony. Here's what I learned from Tony. Rapport. If somebody, like nobody in the history of calming down has ever calmed down because somebody told them to calm down. Have they? Has it ever worked? Everyone. I'm really at calm down. No, no. Nobody in the history of calming down has calmed down because somebody told them to calm down. It doesn't work. So I know there's no point like going, hey, Tony, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So he goes, well, you could be a lot more confident. And I go, oh, believe me, I'm confident. The talk's going to be fantastic. It just might not be exactly what you're expecting. He goes, well, all right then. And I'm like, 
I walk away going, oh my God, what just happened in my life? Like, I, I, what the hell was that all about? He, in the meantime, he's like, I like this guy. Rapport, it's called, right? Rapport. He, I, I like this guy. I want to introduce him myself. Great, except here's the problem. It's a Chinese event. And, and, and the audience is all Chinese. And, and, the, and the translation is not with headphones. It's with the dude on the stage standing beside you, repeating every sentence you say in Chinese, right? So that means, and by the way, these guys are not just translators. They are trans impersonators. They, they, they translate and impersonate. So the guy like Tony Robbins is up there and he goes, look, if you want to create massive action, if you want to get results in your life, you got to make a decision. And then the translator goes, hung ta, so yayo, no da chin ta, which is probably some bad approximation of Japanese and Chinese and rubbish in the middle. But the point being is that's what it's like when they do it. What the problem is, is that when he went, wants to introduce me, we've sent the script and the Chinese translator who was introducing me translated it over to Chinese. And now the English script is gone. So Tony's like, no problem, just translate it back. I don't know if you guys have ever played the uh, tra Google Translate game, but take something in English, translate it to Chinese, translate it to Swedish, translate it to Estonian, put it back in English and laugh your ass off. Like, it, 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 no. So here's what ends up happening. Tony walks up on the stage and he goes, and, and the introduction, by the way, it says, um, you know, our next speaker is not really a speaker. He's actually an entrepreneur with a solid business background. He started his first business in the tech space and he sold it nine years later and retired from the IT sector. It was boring, but it would, you know, I wanted to make the point that I wasn't a speaker, but I'm just a business guy here to share some business stuff. But remember, it says he started his business, sold it nine years later. Tony gets on stage and he's like, you guys, I'm so excited to introduce this next speaker. I was just chatting with the hallway. He started his first business when he was only nine years old. standing off the stage going what the hell just happened what happened and do i go up on stage and correct that and nah, what do i do now let's back up for a minute how many of you forgot that that was just an example anybody just forget that that was it? that's right because that's what a story will do that's what a story will do a story takes you to a time and place gives you an experience and so what happened was I use that story quite often as an icebreaker when I'm going on stage, particularly if I'm speaking somewhere where there's a heavy personal development vibe, right? If you're speaking at a personal development conference, that whole story, being on stage with Tony, it's super credibility boosting. Plus you get to teach some core principles about rapport and all that kind of stuff. And it gets a laugh every single time. So it's a great icebreaker talk. Are you guys with me on that? Make sense? All right. The other thing that you should do that's very important in the icebreaker, in my opinion, or in the F-15, is a big fat claim. The big fat claim. And what the big fat claim is, is a recognition that the people coming to your workshop or coming to your presentation, they, they're just as nervous as you are, assuming you're nervous. And, and I know most people are just a little bit nervous about going on stage and speaking, but they're just as nervous as you are. And you know what they're nervous of? They're nervous that you're about to steal an hour of their life that they can't get back. Come on, how many of you have been to a conference, you're at the conference and you're sitting there, you got yourself a, a chair at the edge, at the edge, at the back, so you can get the hell out when the next speaker sucks. Who's ever had that seat? I've had that seat many times, man. I'm not sticking around for that. I, the number of times I found myself stuck in a middle seat in the middle of the row and then the, 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 the speaker on stage is so terrible and I feel like I can't get out. And that you need to know your audience is just as nervous as you are. And they have more right to be, frankly, because let's be honest, the average conference is not full of great speakers. The average conference out there in the world, the average corporate conference is not full of great speakers. You, you, how many of you have been to a conference where maybe out of, say, 10 speakers on the stage, you're there sitting in your chair, 10 speakers, maybe two of them had a huge impact on you and the rest of them promptly forgotten. Who's been at that conference? Yeah, I've been to that conference and, and I, it blows me away, but I wanna tell you something about that conference. Please hear me. Every single one of you, just with the things I'm sharing with you today can do better on stage than those bad performers. <laughs> it's, not, it's not difficult. It's not difficult to differentiate yourself. And while we're talking about differentiation, let's talk about the imbalance of men and women on the stage. It's just not fair. You know, there's not enough women at the conferences, man. It's not fair. There's a pay gap or something. No, 
All it really comes down to is that there are more male speakers. That's, that's what it really comes down to. I will tell you that if it is unfair, it is becoming unfair for men because conferences are proactively trying to put women on their events and on their stages, which means all things being equal, they will often take a woman over a man. All things being equal, they'll go with the woman. So I want you to know there's a phenomenal demand for female speakers. I have organized conferences. I am often assisting in the organization of conferences. And every single conference that I've been to, except, of course, for the Mind Body Expo and Crystals Fairs, there's plenty of women at those conferences. But at, at, at other conferences, every single one, the conference owners go, we need more women on the stage. We're getting feedback from the audience. There's a phenomenal opportunity for female speakers. You should know that. So you want to make a big fat claim. The big fat claim is designed to put them at ease, to make them feel comfortable, to make them feel like they're going to have a great time, to make them feel like they can relax. And then really quickly, guys, your talk should be mostly story and then information, not information and then story. So this is an example of telling a story to make a point. You tell a story, you make a point. This here is an example where you make a point and then you use a story to anchor that point in, to just anchor the point in. Then this is an example of a story that makes multiple learning points. One story, and as you tell the story. So for example, the Tony Robbins one, I can tell that in 60 seconds or in a half an hour, depending on how much detail I want to go into. But if I tell the longer version, I would say to you that I got this phone call and they asked me if I would come and teach. And you know, sometimes in life, when you're really, really scared, when you're really, really scared, you're up at a, at a tipping point in your life and you just got to say yes, teaching point number one. So I went off to Fiji and as I was on the plane in Fiji, I was thinking to myself, wow, you know, they're only calling me because they can't get anybody else on short notice, but this is an opportunity. Maybe if I do really well, they'll keep me on the reserve list for the next time they can't find any speakers. Now, as the plane started landing in Fiji, I had a new thought what the hell kind of limited thinking is that? Why don't I just do so well that I get to the top of the damn list? And so sometimes we need to think bigger. I've made my next point. And I, as I keep going through the story, I keep dropping truth bombs, right? And, and the thing is, is that those truth bombs will be memorable because they were delivered inside a story. Stories evoke emotion. And emotion is the glue that causes a memory to stick. Just the way it is. If you, if you don't give them emotion, they won't remember anything. If you don't feel, they won't feel. Now you come to your L15. The L15 is the last 15 seconds, the last 15%, whatever you want. It doesn't have to have a defined period of time, but it's the landing. And I wanna say something about the landing. Never, not ever, ever go over time. Now I'll, I'll give you, there are two exceptions to that rule. The one time that you can go over time, one of the times that you can go over time is when the organizer specifically requests that you go over time. If the organizer says, hey, keep going, either because you're doing so well or because they're having a technical problem with the next speaker, you keep going. When, it, when the organizer says, keep going, you don't say, no, 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 no. You fill the time they need you to fill. That's the one time you can go over time. And there's another time you can go over time. And that is when it is your event. If it is your event, then you can talk to the audience and you can determine whether or not you're going to be on time. But if you are speaking at anybody else's event, you must end on time. It is absolutely disrespectful to the organizers and it's atrocious treatment of the other speakers who are due to go on after you to go over time. You must end on time. One of the ways to end on time is to know already how you're going to end your talk. To know, are you gonna have a call to action? Are you gonna to try to get them to vote for you or donate to your political campaign or buy your book or sign up for your webinar or stop using plastic? I, whatever your call to action is, it could be that you have a CTA here. It could be that you have some quote you wanna read right? It doesn't matter. Or it could be a final story you want to tell. But when you know what your L15 is, here's the beauty. You get a five minute warning from the producers and you know that you have a three minute L15. You just calmly relax and know that you can tell your three minute L15 nice and slowly and you can deliver it out beautifully and you can land yourself a, a 10 point landing right on time and have everybody be blown away by what a professional you look like because most speakers don't have that skill and it's so easy. And I'll tell you what happens if you don't have your L15, this is what you're like. You're like a pilot up in the air, running out of gas, looking for an airstrip that they didn't pre-plan for. That's, that's how it is. And by the way, some of you have probably seen a speaker who's kind of come to the end, but they don't really know how to land it. And they're kind of like, ah, oh, well, I could end with this story and that. And, and that's what they're, they're looking around for somewhere to land. 
And it takes all the confidence, it takes all the delivery out of what they've done because suddenly they look like they're an amateur. So by having a cool L15, you know how you're gonna end. And then the last thing, by the way, this is three days of content in an hour. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm giving you as much as I can. I'm hoping that inspires you guys to ask me some questions, whether, whether you're live with me now, I'll take some of those, or whether you're watching on recording and you wanna fire me something on Instagram, I, I, I'll do what I can to answer your questions. Uh, what I wanna say is that, there's one more thing about this, is that when you are telling stories, you gotta use your voice. By the way, those of you who are watching live, do you realize we're almost at the end of an hour? Does it feel like that? Has this gone by weirdly, like quickly, but also it feels like we've spent a lot of time together? That's called time delusion. It's, it's, it's a time distortion. The weird thing is, is on one level, it feels like the hour whips by in 15 minutes, but the other level, it kind of feels like we spent three hours together because you've got so much. And it's not that I said so much, it's that I said it in a way that allows it to go in. You will remember much of what I said. You'll be inspired, I'm hoping. So now, when you're speaking, it is really important that you use some of the principles in what we call at Speaker Nation, broad spectrum appeal. Broad spectrum appeal is the principle that you will sometimes be asked to speak at an event or at a conference or online or record a video, and some members of the audience will not be directly interested in your topic, but you still need to engage them. You see, let's say you're speaking at a conference and there's a thousand people there or a thousand people watching live or whatever and your topic is specifically aimed at about 20% of them, that means you're gonna lose the other 80%. Let me tell you something, if you lose the other 80%, you lose the 20% you're speaking to because there's disruption in the room, right? It, 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 people are getting up and leaving and it just, it, so what that means is, is that you wanna find a way of delivering your content in such a way that no matter whether they're interested in the, con in the, in the content or not, they're interested in the delivery. I had to do a talk in Germany once on entrepreneur, at an entrepreneur conference, actually at a business conference. So people were there talking about IPOs and marketing and all kinds of boring and dry business content, but they wanted me to come there and talk about WildFit. I don't know what inspired them to want me to do that, but you need to understand that the people who bought their tickets did not come there to be told what to eat, right? That's not why they were there. That means my talk is out of context for them. That means my content is not interesting to them. It might be that about 10% of them might be interested in my talk but I now need to figure out a way to deliver it so that everybody enjoys the experience. Because of course I wanna get booked again and I wanna create attraction. I want them to come follow me on social and all that kind of stuff. So first thing I did is I figured out a way to tie my topic to the pervasive feeling in the room. I said, guys, this talk's gonna to be totally different. Now think about that. Immediately people are like, God, I'm sick and tired of the drive. They, they actually want to hear that something's gonna be different. This talk is gonna to be totally different and by the end of it, you're gonna fully understand how to have more energy and drive greater profitability in your companies. Oh, boom, big fat claim. Got it? Big fat claim. They, suddenly they put their devices down. Suddenly they put their devices down. They don't care about WhatsApp anymore. They're listening, they're paying attention. And so then I give a whole talk about the, the, the role that nutrition and health and movement plays in their health, in the health of their staff. I make more big fat claims that if you follow the principles I'm talking about here, you'll reduce your sick days by 80%. And that's massive boost to productivity and, and et cetera, et cetera. I, do, I give the whole talk. It ends up being the highest rated talk of the entire conference. It wasn't even a match for the delivery, right? But I had broad spectrum appeal. So the big fat claim helped, but you know what else helped? Stories delivered in story time voice. That is to say that I used vocal inflection. Hey guys, I've got something really interesting for you. And it and, and means that I used visual, auditory and kinesthetic communication. That is to say loud and fast, moderate and tempoed and quiet and thoughtful with long pauses. I used all of them because all of those people are in the audience. There are some people in the audience that want a quieter, slower message. And there are some people in the audience that want a more moderate airline you know, safety announcement type voice. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow Toastmasters. Today, I'll be speaking to you about how to use your voice like you're on the radio. And some people will like it a great deal and others will simply fall asleep. And then of course, there are other people who want the loud, the loud paced Tony Robbins, rah, rah, up high. The truth is that if you use all three of them, then you create broad spectrum appeal because everybody feels connected with, everybody feels appealed to. So, that's my condensed version of one talk away. And what I'd love to do is talk to you guys. Like, 
answer any questions you guys have. Um, I'm, I'm super happy to go like camera on face to face with anybody. If you've got your, your uh, uh, questions, you can certainly put in the chat. And uh, so Julia, uh, Julia from your side or Sarah, if you've got any questions, I think I gather we've got about like eight minutes or something. Thanks so much, Eric. <laughs> I'm still laughing about your airline voice. That was perfect. You missed your vocation. <laughs> the has popped a question in the chat. Would you apply the same principles to giving a pitch about a big or crazy idea? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. In fact, there's another um, black belt skill that I would add to that, and that is the understanding of the power of an origin story. Um, an origin story describes the journey of discovery that got you to your startup or got you to your breakthrough. And a lot of times that story is a very compelling part of why somebody wants to do business with you. Um, I will tell you that one of the reasons that I'm really passionate about teaching public speaking is that I used to be so terrified of it. And one day, one of my friends sat me down and she goes, Eric, you're so good at this. And I just got invited to do a talk for the board. And could you sit with me? And we sat down on the floor. By the way, there's a picture of this on Facebook somewhere. I don't know where it is. Don't ask me, but I've seen it. It's a picture of me, long hair, sitting on the floor, 20 something years old with this friend of mine and coaching her on how to deliver her presentation. And she came up to me afterward and she said, I felt so free. And I am ultimately about personal freedom and liberty for people. I want people to feel free about the relationship with food. I want people to feel free to communicate. And I so loved her response. I so loved the, how the freedom looked on her that I decided I wanna give this gift to all kinds of people. By the way, for those of you who are curious, do I suddenly sound like even more like, you're like, geez, I'd like, I'd like to learn this from him because his reason is pure. Does that make sense? That's what a powerful origin story can do for you. So yes, absolutely, uh, Tamara, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but you definitely can use um, the same basic structure with origin story to create a ton of attraction. Great question. Anyone else? Karina, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself? Thank you, Eric. That was um, fabulous. And I can certainly put myself in so many of the um, the places I've been to Fiji. Um, I've done Tony Robbins. <laughs> he's, he's huge. Um, yes. Figuratively uh, and literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm not the, the loud sort of person. So how do you get over, you, you're dealing with the fears, the terrifying fears of how do I be a public speaker? All right, you might want to write this down. It's a yeah. formula. You might want to write this down. You ready? Yeah. Get over it. Now, Karina, listen, I might look to you to be very like outspoken and, 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 and extroverted. I'm not. I am a deeply introverted person. You know, during the lockdown, I got locked down on my own in my four bedroom house, separated from my family for four months. And you know, all I kept thinking about is that one video you guys all saw at some point during the pandemic. It's like, there's a huge lockdown coming. Option A, you get locked down with your family. Option B, option B, I take B. Now, uh, clearly I would have preferred to be, but you understand the four months on my own was a gift. I am so introverted. And so what I wanna say is that um, people who are naturally extroverted uh, often want to give too much of themselves. In fact, they do, they, they over deliver. And, and, and over delivery works in a lot of ways, but it doesn't really work as a speaker because it means you go over time. It, it doesn't always work. And so all I would suggest to you is you, you practice with storytelling and also Karina, go sign up for some improv classes. Improv classes will help you break the ice around breaking the ice. You'll, you'll become, you'll start to trust your improv instincts even more. And, and so I really highly recommend improv. Also, for that matter, go and check out any of the programs that we have at speakernation.com. Uh, there, there's a membership there where they have practice storytelling practice time on Fridays, where everybody gets together and does all kinds of storytelling practice with coaching by one of our coaches. So there's a lot of different, plus there's Toastmasters. I'm not a huge fan of their model, but I'm a huge fan of the opportunity. The opportunity is to go practice your speaking in front of a bunch of, of strangers. And honestly, like many things, once you get past the initial ickiness of it, it just goes away and you start to settle into a confidence. And Karina, remember something, you were not born one way or the other around communicating. Everybody was born a public speaker. Every single person was. Ask any two-year-old on a flight. They're never nervous of public speaking. It's something that comes up later in our lives and it can be unlearned for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. I've got one, Eric, it's Julia here. You know, when you see a speaker that's telling a story and it's all about them, yeah. 
how do you find the balance? Because you've done a really beautiful job of, you know, talking about yourself, but not about yourself. How, how have you navigated that one? I think the first thing is to understand that the audience feedback is not where you should be finding that out. Like if you go, for example, if you go look at my video on YouTube, that, that, that one that I was talking about, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's one point something million views. And most of the comments are, this is a masterclass in storytelling. I came here for five minutes and an hour and a half went by. Most of them are awesome. But some of the comments are, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This guy, this, this guy, that like really, you know. So the first thing to understand is the audience isn't the best place to get your judgment about whether your stories are too much you or too much not you, right? The best place to get that judgment is how you feel inside and trusted advisors. And I would start with this, Julia. What's the intent? What is the intent? Now, I can always tell the intent when a speaker goes up on stage and the intent of the story is to is self-aggrandizement, right? Then we definitely do need to cut him down to size. Like, and I've, I've seen that a lot. But when I'm telling stories, I'm telling stories to engage, to entertain, to teach, to impart. And, and so that's usually quite clear in my intention. And by the way, while many of my stories will have me landing on my feet and handling the situation really well, I also have stories about colossal screw-ups in my life where I've done the exact wrong thing. And so when somebody comes and watches the keynote with me, they just see a, a series of stories, some of which I'm the hero in and some of which I'm the victim in and some of them which I'm even the villain in. And so as long as your, your, your portrayal is honest, and your intent is clean, then I think tell whatever story you want. Perfect. We've got time for one more question. Tim's asked, I've started my own business. How do I use this model to generate business without sounding like I've done it all and people think I'm a smart ass and I well, have the skills and experience to help them? Yeah, you know, Tim, again, this kind of comes a little bit down to, um, it comes a little bit down to intent and, and, and it comes a little bit down to, um, look, I, I keep joking about the tall poppy thing in Australia, but the truth is every country has it. Every country has some version of it. In England, the way it works is, yeah, I did this and I got a medal from the government and then somebody in England's gonna go, oh, it's all right for some. That's the English version, all right for some, right? So every country has some version of that. My first rule is this, do not ever hold back your magnificence for the fear of somebody else's little buttons. Like I just, I just, just don't, just don't. I live the life that I live today because the people around me, like my, my girlfriend went to go work for a family. They were so wealthy. They, they, they bought a jet while I was there. They bought another jet. They, they lived, you know, they weren't flashing their money around. They were just living. But I was so grateful that they allowed me to get a glimpse of what was possible because it completely changed my life. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is this. Again, it's kind of like the last question. What is the intent of the story? And, and, and one of the ways that I would really like displace this is, is, you know, be a little bit the reluctant hero. Like, you know, you can, you can tell a story like this where you're, um, where you're like, you know, we were faced with this really tough situation in business. And I got to tell you, I didn't really know what to do. So what I did is I picked up the phone and I called a mentor of mine and the mentor of mine said this, 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 and this. And by the way, we all have stories like that where somebody like perfect one for me. I had my company, my first company, mobile computing, wireless networking. I had the company for, uh, when I got to about the fifth year, I didn't want it anymore. I hated it. I hated barcode scanning equipment. I hated wireless networking. I, I wanted out. And I went to my business mentor and he said to me, Eric, when was the last time your company gave you goosebumps? And I said, oh, well, you know, about two weeks ago, I helped one of my employees get a mortgage for the first time ever. And it's so amazing. And when was the last time? Well, there's other time when this one couple and they needed debt reorganization. And I helped them with that. And he goes, so it seems like every time your company gives you goosebumps, it's because you've improved the quality of the life of your employees. Yes. So you need to restructure the business. The business is now a personal quality of life enhancing vehicle that happens to sell barcode equipment. Oh, so then I hired a manager and the manager came on board and managed that aspect of the business. And I worked on internal business systems and improving the life of the people who work for me. And my business went from strength to strength to strength. When I tell that story, that speaks of an inherent weakness inside me that the mentor helped to pull out of me, right? So it's not about how, what a great hero I was. It was about, I was really gonna give up on my business. Boom, I called a mentor, the mentor helped me out. And so I think that giving credit where it's due um, and, and, and speaking from a place of humility all the time, uh, you know, you, and, and by the way, Tim, here's another one. I'll bet you've got some stuff in your business where you pulled some shit off and you, you pulled some amazing shit off and then you're in your car driving away going, I don't know how that happened. I don't know how I pulled that off, right? Well, admit that. So you tell the story and you go, yeah, and then I did this and I did that. And I'll tell you something I didn't tell them that day. I got in the car, I drove home and sat there going, 
what the hell did I just do? And that, that humanizes it because that's the truth of what happened for you. Cool? Thanks, Tim. Wonderful way to end. Um, great question, Tim. Thank you, Eric. Uh, absolutely fantastic session. Love the energy. So many great insights. And uh, I hope for everyone that's watching this live and the recording that you uh, take some really practical tips away with you and go and find your one talk. Don't wait for it to come to you, go and find it. And um, so lots of praise in the chat, Eric. Uh, welcome.